This story begins in the province of Ako, in ancient feudal Japan. A group of samurai find a mysterious boy. His name is Kai, and no one knows where he came from. Suspecting that he might be a demon, they didn't want him in their province because he could bring misfortune to all of them. My lord, it is a demon. Their master, Lord Asano, thinks differently. He gives Kai permission to live in Ako. He's a child. His daughter Mika also likes the boy and they become friends. The boy grows up in the province, living as an outcast, but still grateful for Asano's kindness and Mia's friendship. One day, a hunting party is out to capture a creature that has been terrorizing Eiko. The creature is a massive six-eyed beast that can easily lift up the horses in the air, let alone the men riding them. Yasuno, one of the samurai, ends up losing his sword and finds himself cornered by the beast. Kai risks his own life to end it, in a dangerous move to save the samurai. He humbly gives the sword back to him. With a disgusted look, Yasuno says he'd rather have perished than be saved by a half-breed. That's saved by a half-breed. When the rest of the samurai get there, they immediately assume that Yasuno defeated the beast. He keeps quiet and takes all the credit. Before they leave, Kai sees a weird white fox looking at him. Each of its eyes has a different color. Meanwhile, in the rival province of Nagato, we see that same fox again, coming to visit their master, Lord Kira. The fox turns into a beautiful lady. She is actually Kira's spy, and she tells him that their attempt to eliminate Lord Asano has failed. When the hunting party returns, Mika welcomes her father. She asks if anyone is her, and Asano gives her a sarcastic look, asking if she's worried about anyone in particular. Is anyone badly hurt? Then, we find out why it's so important to get rid of the six-eyed Zilla. Eiko is about to host the Shogun's Great Tournament, which is a really big deal and everything must be perfect. Asano is very pleased at Mika's contribution in planning the event. He says her mother would have been proud of her. Your mother would have been proud. That night, Mika visits Kai. He's very hurt and she takes care of him. She starts talking about Yasuno. There was shame in his eyes when everyone praised his victory over the beast. Kai can tell she knows what happened. He doesn't want any trouble, so he tells her to go away. He says he'll always love her, but he has his place and she has a different one. When the Shogun arrives, there's a great ceremony prepared. Kai sees a woman who looks familiar. She has the same bicolor eyes as that fox he saw in the woods. Worried about the safety of the province, Kai takes the issue to Oishi. None of them notice that his son, Chikara, is listening to their talk. Kai says there's a witch among them, but Oishi reminds him that only demons can see past a witch's disguise. In other words, he'd better forget about this foxy lady. On the next day, the festivities continue and Lord Kira arrives. He exchanges polite words with Lord Asano, but they obviously hate each other. Kira says, hey, nice concubine you got there. Totally furious, Asano corrects him and says Mika is his daughter. She's my daughter. After the theatrical presentations, it's time for the combat between the provinces. Kira's fighter is a showstopper. Everyone's impressed. Kira tells Mika not to worry. Surely her dad's fighter is just as remarkable. No one looks too confident because their fighter is Yasuno, but they are fully expecting him to make an entrance any minute now. But he has just been visited by the white fox and he's not quite himself when Chikara comes to get him. Kai tells him to go get his father, but there's no time. There's no time. If their province fails to present a fighter, they will be completely humiliated forever and ever. Only a samurai can fight, and these two are no samurais. But wait a minute, who could tell it's not Yasuno behind the mask? The audience is getting tired of waiting. The Shogun has a servant ask Asano where the hell that fighter is, but Eiko's fighter is here. His entrance is not so intimidating as his opponent's, but by now they're just relieved he showed up at all. But even that is about to vanish. Kyra's fighter proceeds to demolish the poor guy. One particularly heavy blow knocks his mask off in front of everyone, and there's a collective gasp of complete shock. The Shogun stops the fight and goes all the way down there. One look at Kai's face determines he's not a samurai, so the Shogun orders the other fighters to end him. Nice old fella, the Shogun. Mika totally panics at the sentence and jumps in front of Kai. Lord Asano begs for forgiveness and takes responsibility for the entire incident. The fault is mine. The Shogun agrees to reduce the punishment to a public beating. Later that day, in Lord Kira's room, the witch is talking about their plan to take Eiko from Lord Asano. She says the time is right because he has a lot on his plate. They carry out a magic ritual that produces a strange spider. Guess how many eyes it has. Yep, another six-eyed abomination. Now we know where the other one came from. With a quick walk along his lips, the spider infects Asano with a purple syrup. He wakes up to a hallucination of Mika being attacked by Kira. Mika. 
he uses a sword to defend his daughter. But while none of that was real, his assault on Kira is actually happening. The samurai come running to restrain him while Kira plays the victim. Oishi can see some of the fog leaving Asano's eyes. In a private meeting with the Shogun, Asano gets the death penalty for having struck an unnamed guest. Because of his rank and reputation, he's allowed to take his own life. Later, he tells Oishi that this will be better than the gallows. Oishi says it's not fair because he was being controlled by someone else. But now, Asano only cares about maintaining the honor of the province. He asks Oishi to act as his second. Saying goodbye to Mika, Asano says she shouldn't let them see her cry. Don't let them see you cry. He goes to a sacred spot with Oishi, who cleans the sword for him. Kai is still recovering from his own wounds, but the other guests are there and they watch Asano's life come to an end. The samurai want revenge. Oishi says that if they start a fight now, they will put the entire province in danger. Not just the warriors, but the farmers and villagers too. It is their duty to think of them first. Mika tells the Shogun that as Asano's only child, she can look after the province until she marries. She doesn't know that it has all been already planned out. From now on, Lord Kira is the one in charge of Eiko. Mika will be given one year to mourn before she marries him. As for Oishi and the others, the Shogun declares that they are no longer samurai. They are ronin, which means a samurai who lost his master. He also makes it clear they are forbidden to seek revenge. The very first thing Kira does is to banish the ronin from their own land. He'll hunt down and execute any ronin he finds there. Mika is horrified to hear this, and the show is not even over. Kai is dragged there on a leash. Kira tells his wife-to-be to take a last look because she'll never see him again. Take a last look. Then he calls one of his men and tells him what to do to Oishi. He doesn't trust him. Oishi is then thrown into the pit. He stays there for a whole year. They pull him out in a pouring afternoon and just drop his weakened body on the ground. His wife and son come running. They give him a warm meal and his wife says all his men have left Eiko. Mika has been taken to the castle to prepare for the wedding since her mourning period is almost over. Oishi asks what happened to Kai. Chikara says he was sold as a slave on a Dutch island. Now that he's fed and informed, Oishi stands up and tells the boy he needs three horses immediately. Before his wife can even think of trying to reason with him, he says she must tell the world she's now divorced. It's the only way to protect her from what he's up to. Oishi says goodbye to her, gives some instructions to Chikara, and leaves with the horses. He finds Kai in the most appalling situation, forced into absurd forms of violence to entertain drunkards. Oishi enters the ring as his opponent because it's the only way to talk to him. And by now, he's so deeply beaten into a fighting machine, he doesn't even recognize Oishi. He keeps saying, hey man, it's me. But Kai keeps swinging that sword near his neck like a zombie. He only snaps back into life when he hears Mika's name. Then they break out of that fighting pit, dodging the bullets from Kai's keepers. Once they're far enough, they get to talking. Now their relationship has changed completely. What use am I to you? Kai is no longer that sheepish apprentice. He's mouthy and aggressive, and Oishi has to admit that he should have listened to his warning about witchcraft. He has failed his lord. He needs Kai's help, and an entire year in a pit must have put some stuff into perspective. So now Oishi behaves with much more respect towards Kai. Outside Kira's castle, a messenger arrives with news from the Dutch island. With the help of a samurai, Kai has escaped. Kira tells the witch to find Oishi. He wants him gone. Kai and Oishi get to the lake where Chikara is waiting for them. He has gathered all of Oishi's men there too. He says he has a plan, and that plan involves disobeying the Shogun's orders. That means whoever decides to join him won't last much. Then he says the plan also involves sending Lord Kira to hell. Everyone cheers. They're all in. <laughs> As the castle is heavily guarded, they need to find out when Kira is going on his usual trip to the shrine. They also need more men and more swords. Oishi assigns these tasks to some of the men. One of them is angry about Kai's presence there and tries to attack him, saying he is not a samurai. Oishi stops him and replies that none of them are. Then each team goes where their task awaits. Oishi and Kai are now in Yutsu, the village of the sword makers. The place looks like Silent Hill, not a soul in sight. When they see a few soldiers, Oishi says they're farmers who want to buy tools. The soldier informs him that this is Lord Kira's village now. We have come to buy tools. Checking out the boy's hands, he says they are not a farmer's hands. Kai can see where this is going and he's got a pretty lady to save, so he attacks the soldiers. He gets it all over with so fast that the others look half embarrassed and half terrified. They start collecting the swords from the fallen soldiers. By now, it has become clear that Kira has conquered that entire region and they won't be able to get any weapons. So Kai shares his secret with Oishi. He says they can find weapons in the Tengyu forest where he was raised among demons. He has vowed never to use the magic they taught him. Oishi is not such a fan of this demon talk, but he's very goal-oriented. He's listening. Meanwhile, one of the Ronin, 
Isogai is fishing for information on Lord Kira's upcoming trip, but he gets sidetracked when he meets a pretty lady. Her eyes are quite unique and she has an investigation of her own. What is your name? Oishi's men carefully enter the forest. They ask about the noise and Kai says it's from the ghosts. Okay then, no worries. Oishi and Kai go into a dark cave while the rest of them wait. Too many people crashing could annoy the demons. Kai tells Oishi not to draw his weapon under any circumstance, no matter what happens. Outside the cave, the Ronin can't be left alone for one second. They're debating Oishi's trust in Kai and defining a time limit to go after them into the cave they have been specifically told not to enter. Kai goes into an inner chamber alone. He's soon joined by someone with a a non-conventional appearance. They talk about the world outside and all the injustice suffered by those who dare to be different or just happen to be like Kai. Labeled as half-breed and rejected everywhere for no fault of his own, everywhere but here. In the outer chamber, Oishi is surprised at the disobedience of his men. All of them are inside. Then Yasuno draws his sword for absolutely no reason. That starts an unbelievable battle and there's a voice in Oishi's head all the time. It's telling him to draw his sword and save his men. Save your men. He's desperately trying to help them without the sword, but they're falling one by one. At the same time, Kai asks for that sword between them, which is supernaturally standing on its tip. The demon says he can have it, but only if he can reach it fast enough. They both fly towards each other, but Kai is faster. The demon is proud to see his pupils not so rusty. Back in the other chamber, everything goes up in dust. Oishi's men have never come inside the cave. It was all an illusion to test his determination. When Kai comes back, there are now several swords available to them. You men are safe. The Ronin are now back to the outskirts of Eiko. Isogai is there and he says Lord Kira is leaving the castle tonight. Oishi doesn't notice Isoiga's foggy eyes. Chikara wants to participate in the attack, but his father says no. He stays behind with an older man. Night comes and the Ronin tiptoe into the trap. The long-haired figure in worshipping position waits until Oishi is very close and then turns around. It's the witch. She sets fire on everything around her with a hand gesture. While the soldiers are shooting their arrow, there are many casualties and some Ronin are badly wounded. Back in the castle, the witch gives a sword to Lord Kira and says it used to belong to Oishi. Then she taunts Mika about the terrible fate of her friends. The witch leaves her blade behind. Good night by Mika's bed and it gives her ideas. At the Ronin camp, we see the witches wrong. Many are wounded, but most of them made it. Oishi blames himself for having waited so long. He should have retaliated right away, even if he failed, because then he would have failed with honor. Kai tells him they still can finish what they started. They have an advantage now. Kira thinks they're all gone. In the morning, Opportunity knocks on their huts. Kai recognizes a passing convoy as the drama group that has once performed in Aiko. When intercepted, the actors say they are on their way to perform at Lord Kira's wedding. They start to elaborate a new plan, while also taking measures about the very high possibility that they won't return. A written account of their story is produced so that the next generation will know what they did and why. Everyone signs it, including Kai. He's no longer an outcast among them. Yasuno even apologizes for the six-eyed beast incident. A bit late, but fine, we'll take it. He says the samurai wears two swords and then he gives him a second one. At night, the big event is about to start. Kira's castle is full of guests and soldiers. They let the drama group through the gates. Let them through. Failing to notice Oishi in that seo wig. At the same time, other Ronin are climbing up one side of the castle and taking down the guards that are watching that area. Many other points in the castle are silently attacked and the guards are gradually replaced by Ronin in disguise. The show begins and everyone is delighted at the pyrotechnic effects on stage. The witch seems to be the only one who is feeling that something might be wrong. When Oishi gets the signal that everyone is in their position, he reveals himself and attacks Kira. A number of parallel battles begin all over the castle, while a group of guards protect their lord and his bride. The witch turns into silk and flies away. Mika takes the opportunity to use the knife she had kept hidden in her wedding dress. The courtyard is a battlefield now, and the Ronin are giving it all they got. Kai and Mika are finally reunited. I knew you'd come for me. Just as he says that nothing can keep them apart, the witch shows up to disagree. With a deep breath and a spin, she turns into a huge dragon. She spits fire at Kai, but the Tengu sword deflects it all with ease. Oishi and Kira now have only a thin wall between them and they both tear it down the moment they realize. It's a tough fight and they damage several rooms while they're at it. Kai drops his sword fighting the dragon, but when he sees Mika is in danger, he quickly gets into demon mode. Retrieving the sword from the ground, he leaps above the dragon's head and strikes. That's the end for the 
the dragon, which slowly turns back into woman form. The witch is gone. Inside the castle, Oishi wins the battle with Kira and dedicates the victory to Lord Asano. Then, he takes a souvenir. He goes up on the rooftop and shows it to everyone. All the fighting stops at once and the soldiers that used to be Kira's immediately kneel before Oishi. Then, the 47 Ronin, plus one princess, make their journey back to Eiko. They visit Asano's grave and Oishi places a sword there, saying he's now avenged and can rest in peace. Catching the stench of happiness somewhere in the land, the Shogun is back in Eiko in no time, with his usual infinite mercy. Give your command forbidding you to take revenge. He allows the Ronin to be punished the same way as Lord Asano. They even get to be buried next to him. Everyone gets ready for the ritual. The Shogun stops it a few minutes in. He says Chikara is forgiven to continue Oishi's lineage. He is allowed to live. That's all the Shogun has to say. All the other 46 Ronin died together. Their story lives on as an example of honor and loyalty. And this is the end. This was a recap of the 2013 movie, 47 Ronin, by H2F Entertainment, starring Keanu Reeves. What do you think? Was Kai wrong to leave the Tengu forest to try his luck in the outside world? Was there another way out for Oishi? Let us know in the comments below with hashtag cinema recap. Until next time.